children can say very creepy and unexplainable things that they should have no knowledge of. Do they see ghosts and talk to them? Can some of them remember their past lives and tell you about them? If you want to find out, keep listening. Because for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. When I was little, my grandfather, who I called Papa, always promised to take me fishing. Things always came up, or I wasn't in town to go when he wanted to go. He died when I was seven, and I never got a chance to go fishing. I had never gone fishing, and have not since he died. Fast forward 20 years. My wife and I have a three-year-old daughter. I have never spoken to her about my pop-up, and I've never even talked about him in front of her. I haven't brought him up to anyone since before my daughter was born. One day, I'm off with my daughter, and she's in her room. Suddenly, she comes running into the living room where I'm sitting, and says the following. Daddy, we have to go fishing. We don't live near a lake or anything, so it's kind of weird for her to say in the first place. Oh, why do we have to go fishing, sweetie? Because Pop-Up says you have to take me. Wait, what? Who told you? Pop-Up. He says you need to take me to go fishing. I'm not really a believer in the afterlife or anything but I damn sure took her on that fishing trip. She has not mentioned Pop-Up since then, and it's almost been a year since it happened. My mum tells this story occasionally. She was driving on the highway, in her twenties, during a snowstorm, and hit some black ice. She spun out, wound up facing the wrong way, while she was spinning, she says she saw her great relative, her great aunt or grandmother, I can't remember which, and that person had died before she was born. She'd never met them, but recognised them from pictures. When I was a child, I would often wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I was just down the hall, but I was scared shitless of making the walk and even more terrified of flushing the toilet, because it sounded deafening in the silence of the night. A few particular scary times, I swear that my grandpa or nana, on different sides of the family, waited for me to comfort me. This was after they passed away. I am 20 now, and would have been aged 5 or 6 when it happened, but I still remember it. My dad builds houses, and when they're done, he has them staged, for when they go on the market. As a kid, he'd pay me to run around the house with painter's tape, to mark out dings and scrapes that had to be patched. Every single house he did, I swore I could see my grandfather, just chilling in a chair usually in the sitting-slash-family room. It was usually a double-take moment when he disappeared, and when I looked directly at the chair, he'd be gone. But I could always recognise him. A few years later, I was out drinking with my dad, and I mentioned how I used to see his father's ghost in all the houses that he built, and my dad got serious and told me he used to see the same thing. I was with my sister, her husband, and their two-year-old daughter. We were talking about loved ones that had recently passed, as my father had died some time recently. My brother-in-law went to grab a picture of his mother, who had died in a car crash when he was six to show me. When my niece saw the picture, she started laughing. 
We asked her what was so funny, and she looked at us and said, That's my special friend who sings to me. I just shiver a bit, thinking about it. My dad is the owner, and runs a hostel in Buenos Aires. We have plenty of people from all over the world, but especially from South America. More often than not, there are no kids around, but every once in a while we will receive families. So there's this family in the hostel, one little boy and his parents. The little boy is the only kid in the entire place. It's a chilly winter night, and he appears in the common room, asking who is the little girl with the yellow raincoat in the bathroom. Once again, he is the only underaged person in the entire place. So we go and check it out, and of course, there's no girl to be found. We found it a bit freaky. We hoped someone hadn't got lost or wandered in. The spooky moment, though, came six months later. That incident had all been but forgotten in my mind, and there are no kids in the entire hostel. When a 40-something-year-old lady from Spain comes up and asks us, whose child is the little girl with the yellow raincoat in the bathroom? So at this moment it clicks, and we get severely creeped out. Again, out of courtesy, we go to check, but there's no one to be found. I found out later that this place used to be a nursing home and a mental asylum before that. And just so that you're aware, the door for that particular bathroom constantly closes by itself. Before, I just thought it was the wind. Now, I have a different hypothesis. This is a combo between my nephew and my son. When my nephew was three years old, he was sitting by my mum's back door looking outside. When she asked what he was doing, he said, playing with the little boy out there. And there was no little boy. Many years later, when my own son was three years old, he was in the same back room and asked if he could go play with the little boy outside. There was still no little boy. What makes it creepy is that my grandmother, their great-grandmother, lost a little boy when he was three years old to pneumonia. My mum still lives in the same house. I lived alone in a cool but kind of creepy old house with my son, who must have been close to three when this happened. I woke up one night because I heard him talking forcefully at something in his room, not quite yelling, but at a level above normal conversation. I got out of bed and went down the long hallway to his room to find him sitting in the corner of his bed, glaring into the opposite corner of the room. I asked him what was wrong, and without taking his eyes off that far corner, which was at my back, he pointed and said quietly and angrily, get that man out of my room. Every hair on the back of my body stood up, and I reached over to flip on the light, and there was no one there, of course. He said the man came into his room a lot, and he hated him. The voice was absolutely full of anger when he spoke about this man. Then he told me that there was a big brown rabbit with long fingers that came and looked in his window every night, as his bed was directly underneath the window. And he didn't like him, but he couldn't come in, and... That was okay. He also claimed the house itself was a lady, and that it sang to him, which is a whole nother story. I took him back to my room from the rest of the night, but the next day, 
it was like it never happened, and he resumed sleeping in his other room. When we moved into my previous house, my daughter ran up to me crying and was incredibly scared. She looked at me and said, Mama, I don't want to go in there. It's really dark and scary. What are you talking about? It's okay. All of the lights are on. No, Mama, it's dark in there. I'm scared. They said they were going to take me. What are you talking about, I ask? Who's going to take you? The monster said, they're going to take me and pull me into the wall. They said I had to stay there forever. It's dark and I'm scared. She then pointed to a black ring on the wall where something large had been hanging and left a mark. I regret not listening to her because living in that house was terrifying. The ring wouldn't come off the wall and was still perfectly visible after being painted over and bleached multiple times. My wife's first husband was Chinese. He came from a superstitious family and when he died they gave a red ribbon to her, which they told her she had to tie to the end of the bed, or else he would drag her down to hell. She didn't do it. She wasn't superstitious. So she left it in a drawer and later threw it out. A while later, we were dating and her brother-in-law came over. It was the first time she'd spoke to him since her husband died. He made her come down and formally invite him in, because he thought he would be cursed if he entered his dead brother's home uninvited. As the hours went by, he got drunker, and soon started pointing in the corner and saying, He's there! My brother is standing right there watching us! He would look, like he was listening to something and then say, he says he misses his son. By night time, he became convinced he was possessed by his dead brother's ghost. And he said, I'm back, my wife, and told her they needed to go to the bedroom to celebrate. He also tried to take a swing at me before we escorted him out and fetched him a cab. About six months later, we had moved to another town and got married. My wife's son had a fever and he kept waking up, crying and yelling. Too scary, too scary. We let him sleep in our bed and he would wake up, pointing to the side of the bed where my wife slept and said, scary man, scary man. Finally, he recovered and his fits died down until one day, my wife showed him a picture of his biological father. He started crying and pointed at it and said, Scary man. My little brother did something that creeps me out to this day. He was around three when it happened. My mum called me from my room to grab her a towel so that she could keep an eye on both of my little brothers that were playing in the tub. I had grabbed the towel and was just walking into the bathroom when my three-year-old brother, who normally had that adorable broken little kid's speech, suddenly sat up straight in the tub, cocked his head and said in the most serious pronunciated voice, Look, Mum, I can't die. He had crossed his arms over his chest and slid underwater. It took a second for me and my mum to react, but she pulled him out of there pretty quickly. He had inhaled a bunch of water and was crying, but he was okay. So fast forward a couple of years. We were replacing the trim in my little brother's room that was adjacent to the bathroom. We were tearing down the trim 
in their closet that adjoined to my parents' room. And we found an old pencil height chart on the wall where the trim was. There was only one name, Alan, and the height chart stopped at the age of five. The old lady that had owned the home before us had sold it to us so that she could take care of her husband in an assisted living home. She had mentioned on more than one occasion that they were the first owners of the house and never had any kids. So we did some research, and thanks to the public library's amazing newspaper archive, we found an article from the 1950s stating that the old couple had indeed had a kid. He drowned in the tub, in the same bathroom my little brother had the episode in. The conclusion in the paper followed somewhere along the lines that his mum wasn't supervising him in the bathroom when he stood up in the tub slipped and hit his head. His name was Alan, and I refused to even go into my parents' bathroom after that. A few years ago, I was babysitting my four-year-old nephew and his two-year-old brother, and had a nice spaghetti dinner. We watched some Thundercats on TV, and I put the boys to bed and went to the computer to play some RuneScape. After about half an hour, I hear something rush past me to the outside of my door. I turn to look, stare for a few seconds, and then go back to gaming after deciding it was nothing. About five minutes later, I hear it rush past the door again, going the opposite direction this time. At this point, I'm thoroughly startled, so I stand up and walk to the doorway. Outside the doorway is a dark hallway leading to the boy's bedroom, and I instinctively whisper, Gabe, into the darkness, assuming the older nephew had gotten out of bed to use the restroom or something. What happens next still haunts me. A toy ambulance to my left suddenly lights up, and the siren starts blaring. I desperately feel along the hallway wall for the light switch, and the siren turns off. Ambulance lights are still flickering on and off, dimly lighting the hallway, and there's silence. I still can't find the light switch. Gabe? I whisper, shouting desperately. In the distance I hear, Come on, vamonos, everyone, let's go! A talking Dora the Explorer doll has just answered me. Now, I'm freaking out, slamming my hands against the wall in the darkness, looking for the light switch. I step forward onto a Hot Wheels car, which sends me crashing onto my ass. I look up to see a three-foot-tall dark silhouette with long, mangled appendages creeping ever so slowly towards me in the distance. At this point, I convince that the kids are dead and I'm next. Not wanting to go out without a fight, I scream profanities at the being, launching the Hot Wheels car in its direction, and run past the being towards the kids' room, hoping they can still be saved. I make it to what I believe is Gabe's bed, reach into the sheets and feel a warm, sticky, soft and squishy mess. I look at my hands, and they're covered in red. I instantly sink to my knees, look over to the bedroom doorway to see the creature standing there staring at me, gangly appendages jiggling at its side. What do you want from me? I shout at it with tears in my eyes. Doodles? The creature responds. What? The light comes on. Standing in the doorway is my eldest nephew Gabe, one hand on the bedroom light switch and the other holding a fistful of spaghetti noodles in a death grip. Doodles, Uncle Justin. See? He says, holding his noodle hand towards me. I look away from him and to his bed, where he had amassed a sizable mound of leftover spaghetti. Doodles for Xavier and me, Uncle Justin. Goddamn noodles. A few months ago, My three-year-old daughter had the flu. 
After she was feeling a little better, my wife took her outside into our backyard to play. My wife was sitting on the back step, and my daughter came up and asked her if she could play with the girl on our slide. My wife said, I didn't see a little girl. And my daughter said, She's right over there on the slide, Mum. Can't I go play? My wife said, I don't see anyone. But my daughter insisted that she was on the slide and that she was blue. My wife is now freaked out. Let's go inside and make a snack. So they did. For the rest of the day, my daughter kept going and looking out the back door and kept telling my wife that the little blue girl was lonely. My boss had two daughters, one of which died very young in life due to a medical condition. She passed away in her early 20s. Anyway, the family found it easier to not keep pictures up of her or really discuss her as their way of mourning. Anyway, the other sister had five children, and on quite a frequent basis, one of her little girls at a very young age would say that she was playing with her imaginary friend Lisa, which is also the name of the deceased sister. Not too much was paid attention to the fact until one day, she also added that her friend was her aunt, and she visited her quite frequently. The little girl had never been exposed to the fact that she had an aunt, and she had passed away before she was born. Nor had she been told her name. I am close to the family, and when I heard that story, it freaked me out. I was tucking in my three-year-old son into bed the other day. We say the typical slew of I love yous, then he just stops talking. Extremely atypical. He has maybe shut up once or twice since his lava stage. So he puts his head down on his pillow, kind of pointing his face down, and rolls his eyes to look up at me. His arms went down by his side, and he just points one finger towards the rocking chair in his room. Without moving his arm, he says, Mummy, before you leave, can you take the rocking chair out of my room so the man will leave me alone? I'm pretty sure all the colour drained from my face. He then proceeds to tell me that the man's name is Johnny and he's a man, a very mean and bad man. Johnny doesn't say anything though because he doesn't have a mouth. He just sits there and stares at my son. My brother grew up being terrified of water. I'm four years older than him, and during the nightly battle for bath time when he was about three or four, I asked him why he was so scared of the water. Being a water baby, as mum put it, I just didn't understand. He looked at me, and I remember this word for word. I was in a big unsinkable ship. We hit the biggest iceberg and then it was really busy. And then I got really cold and wet and I went to a warm bright place and waited until my next family came. My mum heard it all and decided bath time was over. Creepy thing is, my brother was born April 15th, 1992 and the Titanic sunk April 15th, 1912. He's over his fear now and doesn't remember it at all. He's even a swimming instructor now, but it creeps me out just thinking about it. I just mentioned it to him, and he says he's still scared of seawater, and he's not a fan of boats. Between the ages of two and six, my son would tell me the same story of how he picked me to be his mother. He said something, about being with a man in a suit and picking a mother that would help him accomplish his soul's mission. I'm an atheist, 
So he didn't discuss spirituality at that point, nor was he raised in any sort of religious environment. The way he described it was that it was similar to grocery shopping, that he was in a bright room with people who were lined up like dolls, and that he picked me. The man in the suit asked him if he was sure, and he replied that he was, and then he was born. My son also had an early fascination with World War II era planes. He could identify them, their parts, what region they were used from and the like. I still have no idea where he got that information from. I'm a science gal, and his dad is a maths guy. We've always called him Grandpa, because of his peaceful and gingerly demeanour. This kid seriously has an old soul. When I was about five-ish, my dad's cousin shot his seven-year-old son and then shot himself. His wife filed for divorce and wanted custody of their son, and he went crazy. Well, after this happened, my dad and his brother had to clean out their cousin's house. Since I was the youngest one at the time, they all decided, oh, Jess should get the dead child's toys. That's great. So I ended up with one of those little tykes outdoor play castles. Mind you, when my dad was packing up the boy's stuffed animals and stuff into his truck to bring them for donation, he heard a little boy's voice say, what are you doing with my toys? Now, my dad is the manliest man I've ever met. And he said that he got freaked out by the voice because it was so clear. You'd think this would be a good sign to not give me any of his toys. But go figure, I got them anyway. Anyway, the one day I was inside sitting in the tower part, my mum was on the desk and she heard me talking to myself. So she comes over and asks me who I'm talking to. I had a lot of imaginary friends, and I told her I was talking to the little boy whose castle it was, and told him not to cry, because my mummy could be his mummy. My mummy promptly had my dad throw the castle out. I regularly hike at night, oftentimes involuntarily scaring the shit out of others. One summer night, I was on my way down, when I met two women in their fifties, and they asked me if I saw a little girl who was thought to have escaped a psychiatric hospital in the city. They told me that she is scared of people, and always talked about running away and living in the woods. So there I am going downhill, under dark pines, moon shining through branches, and I am listening to music. Suddenly, my peripheral vision catches something horrible. A huge bald head with tiny dark slots for eyes, resting on a tiny frame. It's standing between the pines and watching me from above. I stop dead and don't say a word. With a racing heart and blood throbbing in my ears, the staring felt like forever, when suddenly, this thing made a retard ultrasound scream and ran away into the darkness. Luckily, it all got to me quickly. It was the hydrocephalus girl the woman told me about earlier. I called the police immediately and hung around for some 15 more minutes and pointed in the direction that she went. The next morning, I read in the news that she was found well. But I will always remember the horror that I felt at that moment. When my daughter was around three, she was drawing tons of circles and dots. Eyes, she called them. I asked her whose eyes they were, and she said hers. I said, whose? And then she looked at me and said, in a voice similar to the girl from the poltergeist when she says that she's back, She's gonna kill you. It would have freaked me out so badly, 
But she always used to look past me. I guess at a ghost or something. So I knew something was following us. I almost shit myself. My sister almost shits herself. And my niece was freaked out too. Shortly after that, I started seeing something out of the corner of my left eye. In the furthest corner. Always blurry. And always white. I had to sit with somebody on my left. So the spirit would leave me alone. It's gone now. But it was about three years ago. And my daughter doesn't remember it. So she can't verify that she saw spirits. When I was four years old. My dad's father passed away from bladder and lung cancer. It was really tough on my parents, as they were taking care of him at home in his last months. The day after his funeral, we sit down to breakfast, and four-year-old me says, I saw Grandpa last night, and he told me to tell you not to worry anymore. He's happy. My parents were completely taken aback by it. I did the same thing the following morning, and then never ever mentioned it again. I asked my dad about it today, and he said that up until that day, I had never told my parents about the dreams I had. He said that it was a huge comfort for him to hear me say that, as I was far too young to make anything up like that and wasn't known to invent stories. When my son was about 18 months old, we still lived in an older house, built in 1906. He would occasionally talk to himself in his crib, which is fairly normal stuff for kids. But unlike the usual stream of conscious babble that kids do, he often sounded like he was having an actual conversation in there. He would wait for somebody to answer. One time, we came upstairs at around midnight, long after we had put him to bed, and we popped in to check on him. He was wide awake, and I walked over to his crib to comfort him, and he pointed to his overhead light, which was off, and said, Light! A second later, the light in the room came on. My wife was in the bedroom down the hall, and the switch to those lights was on the other side of the room, near the door. There was no way any human could have been there to turn the light switch on. The way he said it, it sounded like the lights had been coming on and off for some time. So you're probably going to protest, and say it was some kind of Spooky coincidence based on shoddy wiring, as the house was built in 1906. Right? Wrong. We had the wiring we done in 2006, a hundred years after. And the switch was in the on position. I was pretty stirred by the whole thing. I got that what the hell sensation in my chest. And that's when my wife had admitted to me that she had heard things when I was at work, like doors slamming, even when windows were all closed. She found the attic door open sometimes, when she and both my son had been downstairs for hours. She was convinced that the house was haunted. I wouldn't be surprised. It had a creepy playroom slash bedroom in the attic, and there were the remains of the foundations of a house that burnt down in the 40s, in a wooded lot next door. We moved shortly after that for different reasons, but we had an ethical debate on whether or not to legally disclose that the house was haunted on our seller's agreement forms with the realtor. My daughter used to talk about the man with the black face and no eyes, who stood in the corner of her room and watched her when she was sleeping. I had an experience of a what the hell variety in the chest, and one morning I came out of my bedroom to find her door slowly swinging open and closed, open and closed. I assumed that she was doing it, but when I peeped into her room, 
She was asleep in the bed at the time. I watched it for a bit, as my heart slowly sank to my shoes in fear, and I just put my hand out to stop it. We moved not long after that for different reasons. The house wasn't old, but the women in my family have a history of seeing and communicating with the dead. I won't put much stock in it, but it's always made me wonder. My mum and I used to go on walks to the cemetery down the street. I was a creepy kid and loved spending my time in them. She had a friend living in the house a block or two down the road from us. I think I was about eight years old at the time. And as we were walking, I stop in front of the house and I just stared. I remember just being entranced by the house and then walking away with my mum. I didn't actually learn what happened until years later. Apparently when I stopped, my mum asked if I wanted to go in to pay a visit to her friend Terry. But then I replied, no, Terry's dead. My mum laughed a little nervously and said, Terry isn't dead, I just spoke to him on the phone. I didn't take my eyes off the place and furrowed my brow and said, but I thought he died in a fire. My mum told me she never knew anyone who died in a fire, most certainly not Terry. And then I go back into detailing how it happened. He was making something on either the stove or the oven, and he fell asleep. His fire alarm wasn't working, and his house went up in flames. My mum was terrified, and ended up going straight home, skipping the cemetery. She called her friend Terry and told him what I told her. He was in the middle of making food and my mum told him to check his fire alarm. It was out of batteries. My parents were babysitting my brother's five-year-old daughter for a few days. In the middle of the night, their dog gets up and started growling and barking crazy at their bedroom door, with just my mum, dad and the child in the house. My dad got up, opened the bedroom door, and heard the girl making noises down the hall. So as he was walking through the house, as he had to pass the kitchen on the way, he noticed every single knife from the kitchen was lined up on the kitchen table. And this five-year-old wasn't even tall enough to reach the kitchen drawers. So he proceeds to walk to the bedroom where the kid was and she's standing in the doorway. My dad says, Ellie, why did you take out all of those knives? To which she replies, why is your belly all cut up and your guts hanging out everywhere, fat man? At this point, he started praying or something and the rest of the night, went fine. My youngest had a hamster that had died right after a couple of fish died in the tank we had. She was pretty devastated and sobbing uncontrollably. So being a desperate dad, I offered to get her another hamster. Pretty low maintenance pet for her mum and I to deal with. So why not? My daughter was four at the time. Anyway, she stopped crying, looked up at me and said, No, no more hamsters. Everything dies. Besides, it's grandma's turn to die. Her grandmother died next week, unexpectedly. My oldest is now 23. He had cancer when he was 16. He's in remission now, but it's seriously screwed with his outlook on life. When he was about three, my mother passed from cancer, and her sister passed away the same week, also with cancer. I was home from two funerals and pretty wrecked mentally. And when he came to me, he sat down with me quietly, and just looked up at me and said, Daddy, it's going to be okay. No one else will have cancer for a while. I won't have it until I'm a big kid, 
but I won't die, so don't worry. They're just going to take a marble and it'll be okay. Being baffled, and even more shell-shocked, I was just pretty speechless, and put it out of my mind. He had testicular cancer, and they removed one testicle to treat it. Four years ago, I went with my buddy to drop some stuff off at his ex-father-in-law's house, who was doing some yard work while his youngest was sitting on the front steps talking to herself. Buddy and I are making small talk with her, asking if she has an imaginary friend, kind of joking though, and she replies that yes, his name is Sammy, but he only wants to be my friend. He looks like a shadow because he worked hard, so don't be mean to him. We teased her a little bit, but she gave us a really mean cold stare and yelled out loud, let's go Sammy, before stomping inside with Sammy. At that point, her dad came up wondering why she got so upset, and we started joking about Sammy, but he didn't find it funny. He pointed out that there was some soot underneath where Sammy had allegedly been sitting, but I swear I didn't even notice until he pointed it out, and told us that ever since his daughter started talking to Sammy, he's had to sweep soot off of those steps. I still thought it was bullshit though, and fast forward a few months, her father sends her up to Jersey to live with her mother, because she's been staying in her room all day every day, and she was suspended twice in a seven week period for threatening to kill her classmates, which she hasn't done before Sammy's friendship, according to her dad and my buddy. Playing with Sammy all the time. The day her mum picks her up, my buddy alleges that they catch her making a noose in her room, and he rips that shit right out of her hands and brings her into her mum's car. He says she was having a nuclear level tantrum, except she was screaming, I have to go to sleep if I want to stay with Sammy. I have to not breathe or he won't be my friend anymore. Yeah, we got that girl out of there quickly. They left boxes and stuff behind. That's how bad it was. That same night, her dad hears shit going on in his daughter's now vacant bedroom. So he busts in with a .357 and finds all of the boxes open with soot all over everything. So yeah. He decides to move out of that house. I went with my buddy to help move, and we were cleaning out the attic. Lo and behold, we find a name card for a mine, along with a lunch pail, both reading Samuel. My buddy still has that bloody pail. As far as I know, he's just keeping it because he wants to take that demonic ghost shit home with him. My son was born with multiple ventricular septal defects, which basically means holes in his heart. He heard the stories of how close he came to death before the defect was discovered. So when he was about four years old, I thought he was merely misremembering the story when he started talking about the way and day that he died. Buddy, you didn't die, I say. Yes, I did. There was a lot of blood. No, I think you're confused. You didn't even need surgery. The holes in your heart closed on their own. You're fine now. No, not that time, Daddy. When I was inside Grandma Lynn. At this statement, I paused. What? I was inside Grandma Lynn's belly. Then I fell out, and there was so much blood. My mother, Grandma Lynn, 
had miscarried at 10 weeks before she became pregnant with me. Then I recall something he'd said to me the day before that I hadn't given much credence to because kids all say inexplicable things sometimes. He'd said, I'm so glad to be a part of this family and not your first one. To this day, it creeps me out. When my now 17 year old daughter was a baby, maybe around 10 months or so, my dad came to visit us. He was in terrible shape with vascular dementia and he could barely speak, maybe a word or two, but never made much sense. We didn't know where he'd gone one afternoon and we later found him sitting on the floor of the baby's room. She was asleep in her crib for a nap. My dad died that year. The baby was 16 months old at the funeral. I remember it all so clearly. Fast forward to when my daughter was five. We were driving to kindergarten and she started chatting away about the man who came to visit her room once and told her how confused he was and how he needed help and wished she could help him get home. She then said, I've seen him a lot in my room since, but he's better now, not sad anymore. He tells me funny stories and told me I should run fast and gives me kisses on my forehead. She also says that he always wears a yellow shirt and patchwork pants. Lots of different squares, she said. My dad was super preppy and wore those pants a lot. His favourites. Anyway, I think my dad had talked to her one day when she was a little baby and then maybe came back to visit since he passed. Everything she said fits. He was a high school track coach and said track was a great sport for girls and my dad always kissed me square on the forehead from when I was little until he died. Is there an afterlife? Who knows? But my dad would want to see his granddaughter if he could find a way to visit. He was excited to be a grandfather forever and it was very sad that his dementia hit so badly when I finally had my first kid. I've always asked her about it a lot since. No new stories. And as a 17 year old, she doesn't remember much of it. Just what I told her that she told me. The flat we live in belonged to my husband's grandmother who died long before I was ever in the picture. He was 18 when she died and instead of selling it, he just moved in with some of his buddies. Then I moved in and then later they all moved out. My son will often talk to himself, mostly babbling while he's playing alone, but sometimes for long conversations. We're also trying to teach him English. So if he says something in French, I'll ask him to repeat it in English for me. One day, he bursts out with this, and I ask him to repeat himself in English. Grandma doesn't like it when I speak English. She says it's an ugly language. I sort of laugh it off, and my husband asked him if she had a problem with mummy's accent. No, she said Americans you can understand at least. Not like when you had that friend from Liverpool stay here. There was a scouser that lived with them for a few weeks when it was just him and his roommates. Some friends of friends who were looking for a place to stay. I didn't even know about that guy. And there's no way my son could have. Let alone the word scouser. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. This was a slightly different video. I know these aren't all complete stories, but more little segments, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. I did a similar video to this one about two years ago, and I think it was my first ever video that actually picked up some real views on its own. 
which was amazing. So I thought I'd revisit one of my favourite topics because now that I have a daughter, she can't talk yet, but I'd love to see if she comes out with any creepy things. Of course, if she does, I'll let you know. I also want to give a huge shout out to my good friend Briefcase, who launched this super creepy video. Why don't you check it out? I think you'll really like it. It's about Hong Kong's most notorious serial killer. And my goodness, he did some horrific, horrific things. Just to give you a little taster, I'm just going to say that they didn't call him the Jar Killer for nothing. Let your imagination run wild with that. I'll leave a link at the end or in the description. Please check it out. It is going to freak you out. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a comment and a like. Now why not subscribe and hit the little bell icon for fresh stories every night. If you have a story that you would like to share, all that you need to do is send it to my email or post it to my Reddit. But please bear in mind that stories need to have punctuation, paragraphing and a lot of description in order to be featured. But anyway, for now guys, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.